Hello everybody, welcome to this week's live stream, uh, the normal end of week live stream where we have a look at what's going on in markets. Um, if you haven't been to these before, I'll whiz through a load of markets, the major markets. We'll take a look at perhaps where the opportunities might be next week. And then um, we'll, I'll go into the questions and have a look at any markets that you want looking at. Thought we'd um, we'll get into it in a minute, but I think that I mean, clearly the dollar's been interesting this week with such a big week for inflation. And next week we've got the Fed minutes uh, next week on Wednesday evening, my time. So I think plenty more volatility there. Anyway, let's um, get the housekeeping done. Then we can make a start. So to do a risk warning, this presentation is only for educational purposes. It does not contain and should not be construed as containing investment advice or an investment recommendation or an offer of or solicitation for a transaction in any financial instrument. David Jones accepts no responsibility for any use that may be made of these comments and for any consequences that result. You should consider whether you understand how spread bets, CFDs, futures, foreign exchange work, and whether you can afford to take the high risk of losing your money. Trading is risky. Okay. Uh, so, quick look at the major stuff for next week. There's a lot going on next week. I mean, this week we've had inflation data out of the US and the UK um, eased slightly month on month. I think inflation in the US, the, the rate has been dropping for seven months. In the UK, it's been dropping for three months. Obviously, it's still high. Uh, and then we had yesterday producer price index. Uh, sort of wholesaler inflation, and that was, uh, I think, a bit higher than expected. So that did spook markets yesterday. I think when, when they were starting to get used to this downward trajectory for inflation, that did uh, cause some volatility across markets, which we'll have a look at in a second. But um, first of all, next week. So Chinese interest rate on Monday. Um, we'll see. Probably not a major announcement, but I thought I'd flag it up as interest rates are very much in focus. Tuesday, we've got Canadian inflation data out. Wednesday, there's New Zealand interest rate decision uh, on Wednesday. And for me, the big one for next week is Wednesday night, uh, so the Fed minutes. So we don't have another interest rate decision out of the US until the 22nd of March, I think it is. But we do have next week the minutes from the latest Fed meeting. So we can normally expect some volatility. Uh, off the back of those. I think they're out my time, 7 p.m. my time on Wednesday, which would be 2 p.m. Uh, New York time uh, next Wednesday. So that for me is the big one. But on Thursday, we've still got US GDP data. So how well or not is the US economy doing? So that could be interesting to watch as well. So it's another one. Oh yeah, you just reminded me. Thanks for that, Richard. Monday is President's Day. So it's a holiday in the US. Some markets Closing early or closed overall. So we could, as Richard points out, we could well see uh, lower volumes on Monday. Could be a bit of a, an odd day for volumes. I always forget about these holidays. So thanks for flagging that one up. So, um, so yeah, so that's it. Quiet start to the week and then lots going on as the week goes on. Uh, a quick word from the sponsor, which is me. Uh, I run a trading course. There are two parts of the course. Uh, there's medium term trading, holding positions over weeks and months. There's 11 pre-recorded video lessons on that. Short-term trading, holding positions over hours and days. There are seven video lessons on that. Part of the course are four live webinars that I run every month with those on the course. Uh, there's a WhatsApp group that you can join after, uh, well, whenever you sign up for the course, you can join up for the WhatsApp group. Because I know that once, you know, it's it, there's still an element, I think, of hand-holding and support and all of that, so that's the idea behind the WhatsApp group. So that's been running for a couple of months now for those on the course. So that's what you get access to as part of the course. Um, if you've watched this, you've probably seen this before. If you haven't, when um, I launched the short-term course in the autumn of last year, I think one of the big problems with trading courses is the element of smoke and mirrors that you have, that everyone's, lots of people are really cagey about you know showing their results and stuff like that. I bet if you go back to this YouTube channel, you can see go back to November and watch videos from there, you'll see me updating the results of my trading. I decided to trade this £4,000 account um, using the approaches I outlined on the course. So I started, I said I was going to trade it for three months publicly and make the, make the P&L public. Uh, so that ended at the end of January, £4,000 account. The realised profits in three months 
we're just under £2,200. So it's about 55% return, much better than I thought it was going to be. Um, obviously, they weren't all winners. About what, it was that, The win to loss ratio was pretty good. Two thirds of the trades uh, were winners, the third were losers, sensible risk management, uh, all of that. But that was the result of me trading uh, that account. You can see more information on the website, but um, I did it to show uh, putting these things in practice with a real account, you know, and not just come up with a load of fluffy numbers that you might have achieved if you trade it historically. So uh, those are the numbers. Uh, to find out more detail, uh, go to the website. Of course, I should say past performance is no guarantee of future performance. You know, so for, for example, this month, it's a tough month for me. So I was up 20% last month as part of this and down, I just did the numbers before I came on, down about 8% so far this month. It's been the first losing month since, uh, well, not, we haven't finished the month yet, but first losing month since I think September for me. But again, it's part and parcel of trading. You know, they can't all be winners and I've still got a couple of weeks left of the month and I'm doing that by booking some of the open positions I've got that are currently against me. So we'll see where we are, but as usual, I'll do an update uh, at the end of February. But that was the three month period of trading and there were periods within that trading where it was um, a bit flat and a bit sideways and I had a couple of weeks where it was giving back profit, you know, but that's all part and parcel of trading. So you can find out more about the course uh, if you go to my website. Trust Pilot Reviews, uh, if you get put David I'm Jones. I'm doing that by booking some of the open. If you, oh, I'm not, not quite sure what happened then. It's my live, for some reason, oh, it's come up there, okay. For some reason my live stream started playing on my, on my desktop, which has really confused me. Anyway, Trustpilot reviews for the course. Put David Jones trading into Trustpilot. Eight five-star reviews so far, so thanks very much for that. Um, I started doing a newsletter um, a few weeks ago now. It goes out on a Saturday. The next one goes out tomorrow. I've almost finished writing it, so it's a quick catch-up. What's happening in markets? What's the hot market to watch? I'll be watching, I should say next week. A trading tip. Tomorrow is another demon trading tip, even if I do say so myself, uh, and an update on my trading performance. Uh, the newsletter is free of charge, so if you, it only comes out once a week. I don't spam you. It's all done through, uh, through MailChimp, the, the newsletter provider, so you can always unsubscribe. If you go to the website, jonesthemarkets.com, and scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, put your email address in there, uh, you'll get an email. Uh, you get included on the newsletter list and it goes out on a Saturday morning, uh, my time. Uh, there's the website, jonesandmarcus.com. The link should be in the description of this video. And any questions, drop me an email, dj at davidjonestrading.com. All right, that's it. Let's get into it. So, a big week for inflation this week. US, like I said, US and UK inflation easing back again. But yesterday, that producer price index number worse than expected or higher than expected. So I thought we'll have a quick look at the dollar and then we'll look at stock markets. Because I think this dollar index, if you've watched any live streams I've done in the past, I'm a big fan of the dollar index. So it's the dollar against uh, a basket of different currencies, uh, the euro, the yen, the pound, the Canadian dollar, some others as well. Um, and it's quite a good blended look at the dollar. And um, I'm wondering, I think it's gonna be a really interesting week to watch next week, the US dollar, because we had this great run and I traded it a lot on the way up. It was early in the trade, it's two years ago now. I remember buying into the US dollar in Jan 2021 and it took until May of that year, May, June, to really start getting a move on. So I did various trades in and out, medium term positions on this trend all the way up. So it was a really good market. Um, and then since then we've seen this market under pressure. It's had a good run this week. Oh. Sorry, that's my, that's my alert for live cattle. Let me get rid of that. There we go. Uh, so it's had a good week. Uh, we'll have a look at live cattle. So had a good week this week uh, on that inflation data. And I'm just wondering, I don't know, um, this 101, 101 on the US dollar index was sort of big support on the way up. So, um, but I don't really expect the market to have done a handbrake turn. So what I am wondering, are we going to see the dollar index under a bit of pressure? Let's see. I should say I'm short at the moment, the dollar index. So that's my position. So I don't want to be, I don't want to be accused of talking my book. But I was just wondering, okay, it's had a little bit of a run up. I went short this week because we were back up there going near the trend line. 
Uh, 105.60 is a big level. Is it going to run out of steam and retest 101 before maybe thinking about turning around? Let's see. Let's see what happens on that. Um, but I think given all of the inflation and the Fed minutes that are out next Wednesday night, I think the dollar index will be a really interesting market to watch. If that does break through 105.60, um, then I change my mind and think that's it. We're looking at a dollar recovery. Let's see. Let's see what happens. But um, an interesting one to watch, I think, the, uh, the US dollar uh, next week. Let's have a look at some of these stock markets. Start off with the NASDAQ. I do have, I think the NASDAQ's interesting because we had seen, you know, just, just to remind ourselves, we had had since the November 2021 highs, this downtrend in the NASDAQ. My view is given the strength that we've seen, uh, well, this year, we've broken out of that downtrend. We broke the old highs. And so for me, I always want to see extra confirmation, not just the break of a downtrend, but the break of um, a previous major level. Uh, and I think we've seen it. So the NASDAQ did, in early Feb, push to a fresh recovery high. We saw it get slammed quite hard yesterday. Let me show you. In the last hour, here we go. The last hour here of trading. So between 8 and 9 o'clock my time. Uh, so uh, what's that? 3 and 4 o'clock in the US, New York time. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's interesting here for the rest of today. I think if there's a market you wanted to watch for the rest of the day, I think the Nasdaq's an interesting one. You know, could, so you could take the view, you know, before we sort of get slammed, the trend for the week had been up. Has the market overreacted? Let's see. Let's see what happens. I think it's interesting that we had the lows on Tuesday around 12,360. That was quite a good, good support, good spiky low. That would have been on US inflation data, I'm guessing this volatility. So we saw 12,360 was a level. I think it's an interesting market to watch this afternoon. I would be leaning towards looking to see if it can recover. It's been pretty volatile over the last six hours or so, but let's see what happens. So an interesting market on the old short term to watch. On the dailies, for me, a um, bit of volatility, but the bigger trend uh, off the lows is still up. So if I tidy this chart up a little bit, hold on a second. And let's uh, drop some stuff in here. Uh, then the trend looks like that. So it is having a little look below that trend line that's been in place uh, for most of this year since early Jan. Um, but for me, we've got a lot of support from a medium term point of view from 11,500 to 11,800. So as far as I'm concerned, assuming those levels hold, which are 800 points below where we are now, the, uh, the the recovery in the NASDAQ is still on. So another interesting one next week, considering that we've got those um, uh, Fed minutes out on Wednesday. So that's the NASDAQ. So I'm still bullish on that, uh, but a bit of volatility. Same for the S&P, really. I mean, the S&P recovery has, has not been perhaps as convincing, so far at least, as the old, uh, what's it, the old NASDAQ. Um, but we still have this recovery in place off the October lows. Uh, we're trading now where we were at the beginning of the month. So we had a lot of noise, no real direction. So for me, this is another market. This is an interesting one to watch next week. We've seen it hit yesterday. Do we see the buyers come back in? Do we see um, people taking the view that, that the weakness is a buying opportunity rather than a selling opportunity? So, so again, as far as I'm concerned, you know, there's a lot of support, big support. Oh, messed that up. Down at 38 80 ish, so about 80 points below where we are now. 80 big SP points below where we are now. So for me, I still be a buyer of dips uh, on the NASDAQ, on the SP. So let's see. Let's see what happens uh, next week. The Russell as well. I thought we'd do the Russell. I always forget to mention this the old Russell index, the Russell 2000 US index. I think this is an interesting one. This was, this, you know, started breaking out of the downtrend in the summer of last year. So it looked promising. There was a lovely, this is of course classic hindsight TARDIS trade, where the market came back, the Russell came back in September and October last year and bang, right on that low from June, springboarded higher. Um, and it's been a bit sideways since then. Interesting market, but a bit trapped over the last, what is it, six months or so. So for me, it needs to break through 2030 to start getting a move on. It's, you know, it's failed again 
this month ahead of 2030. So perhaps we've got a bit more chop on the old Russell index, uh, but, but another interesting market to chuck into the mix with the, uh, the NASDAQ and the S&P. Let's come over to this side of the Atlantic, uh, the, the DAX, same old on the DAX really. The recovery continues. The DAX has been recovering for longer and stronger than US markets. Um, did hit a recovery high in Feb, 9th of Feb, just over a week ago. It's been a bit, again, a bit sideways for the month so far. Uh, but for me, the, the trend is still up on the DAX. You know, we've got short-term support, 14,900. So about, what's that, 550 points below where we are now. So I'd still be a buyer. We do have a bit of the old uh, bearish divergence going on. For fans fans of the squiggles, we, we saw the RSI. This is a 10-day RSI. Uh, push up uh, mid-Jan. Push a bit higher again into Feb. But the RSI has been falling. So... It, this is, I don't pay that much attention to RSIs, but things like divergence I will pay attention to because it can be a suggestion that perhaps some of the short term momentum at least is running out of steam. So um, there you go. So perhaps we could see a bit more pressure for this index, but for me, the trend is still up. And then the FTSE, FTSE 100, uh, fresh all time highs this week in the FTSE. Uh, yeah, it's a really interesting market that considering that for you know a lot of the time on the way up, the recovery. It was lagging during COVID. Obviously, it went up, but not as fast as the US indices did. And here we go. It's, it was a great run. What were the lows? The lows in October last year, 67. And here we are at 8,000. So 20% higher since um, those October lows. Big old move in the FTSE 100. Again, I'd be a buyer of the dip. You know, we had uh, the little levels before we broke out around 7,700. So even if the market lost a couple of hundred points from where we are now, we're still in that trend off those lows from October. So let's see. Let's see how that works out. So like I say, an interesting week next week with these Fed minutes. NASDAQ is one I will be watching to see what happens. Interesting what happens the rest of the day. It's pushing to new lows just now for today. Let's see if we get a bit of a snapback in the NASDAQ. But, but overall, even though we've had a bit of short-term volatility, uh, for me, these, these indices are still up. Okay. Let's take a look at um, gold, gold and silver. The gold hit new lows, yeah, new lows for the year in gold today. So we had had, if I get, let's get to the RSI for now. So we had had um, a good trend in gold since, well, actually from before here, but, but since November, it'd been hugging that trend line, came back down to it, broke it, and I wondered, are these old lows going to hold around 18.20? And uh, the quick answer, short answer is, they are getting probed today. Uh, I think I did a video on gold last week musing whether we'd already seen the highs for the year in gold. Um, and I think maybe, well, I don't know, maybe we have. You know, if you look at, if we go back and look at the bigger picture for gold over the last, what's this, two and a half years. You know, we did see that move last year on the Ukraine invasion by Russia. Couldn't take out the all-time highs. And then, of course, we know it, it sold off uh, into the last quarter of last year. So above 2,000 is a real problem uh, for gold. And here we are now. Uh, we've drifted back. Yeah, all, yeah, we have seen fresh lows for the year for gold. So absolutely under some pressure at the moment, uh, the price of gold. I wonder if we get back into, if we do push back into this zone, 1730 to 1800, this sort of area, if it did slip that low, do we see some stability? But if we do see this dollar continue to rise, and obviously that is going to put uh, part of the pressure on gold a little bit. Uh, so if we're on the hourlies now. So the shorter term chart looks something like that. So for me, at the very least, to think about this downtrend reversing, I would want to see a move through yesterday's high. Let's call it Let's round it up and say 18.50. So the market is 18.25 at the moment. So I'd want to see it move through um, yesterday's high, 18.50, to start thinking that perhaps things were on the turn. So um, yeah, so given that the Fed minutes next week, another interesting market to watch because of the, the US dollar implication. Silver, silver's breaking lower as well. Um, 
or is, is continue to push lower, I should say. So we've seen, again, the usual nutcase performance from silver. Highs for the month of 24.60, and here we are at 21.20. So it's lost, what's that, $3.40. So it's lost about 12, 13% from those highs just at the beginning of the month. But we've got big support coming up. Trend is absolutely still down in silver. Let's see what happens if it gets down to $20.50. Really oversold on the RSI, if you're a fan of the RSI. Uh, not surprisingly, given the size of the decline we've seen in the last couple of weeks. Uh, but, you know, interesting to see what happens. I mean, I've said on many occasions, I hate silver. When I buy it, it goes down. When I sell it, it goes up. It just seems to have a mind of its own. Or it doesn't respect my view of it. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's not a market that I trade very often silver. But... I think there's, you know, we had a bit of, these were the old highs, you know, from August last year around $20.50. So $20.50 to 21 if you were a big fan of silver, that could be an interesting area, couldn't it, to keep an eye on. Let's see, let's see what happens. So that's that. Let's take a look at some of the currencies, then we'll take a look at the energies. So euro, euro dollar, still under pressure, did look the other day like it was going to try and stage a rally. This candle here I'm looking at, this one here on um, Tuesday, but it didn't last long. Uh, and it slipped, it's back to uh, the 9th of Jan lows. So what's that? Uh, five week low on the euro against the dollar. I quite like this though, because I do wonder if we do see further euro recovery in 2023. So I have been waiting for a deeper sell off for the euro based on the trend that's been going since September last year. We got good support, as far as I'm concerned, at 104.80, about 160 points lower than where it is now. So um, yeah, I think it's an interesting market to watch next week. Still under pressure today, uh, but do we see perhaps, perhaps some, uh, some buying interest come in at 105, 106, that sort of area. And uh, I think if, if we saw it stabilise for a bit, I would be a buyer of Euro US dollar when it stops going down. So uh, I think that's, a, that's another interesting market, I think, to watch uh, next week for me. The Euro against the dollar. And all, for me, it's all about this 105 level. Let's see what happens. Pound against the dollar, similar picture. You know, we've had some volatility this week on the inflation numbers for the pound. Um, I, don't think, I don't think it's as strong an argument uh, not for my trading anyway, for being a, pi a buyer of the pound as it is for being a buyer of the euro because the pound hit these highs in December, 124.50, couldn't take them out this year. So it's been a bit sideways this year, pound against the dollar, uh, but the level to watch 118.40 or thereabouts, if we flip this over to an hourly chart, there we go, it's the old low from back here, the 6th of Jan, so it's the lows for the year. So I do wonder, Again, if there is a perhaps, perhaps a turnaround in sentiment coming for the pound next week. Let's see. If you start breaking below there, though, you know, I think that the risk is for a much deeper sell-off. You know, perhaps even back to these like 112, 114 sort of levels, which were only in November last year. But I would be wondering, do we see a bit of buying, a bit of strength coming? You know, it's, it has today traded as low as uh, 119.15. And it's bounced back about 50 points. So a lot going on in the old uh, FX markets uh, at the moment. Um, should we do one more Aussie dollar? Let's have a quick look at what that did. And again, this is another. You know, this is this is obviously all as a result of dollar strength. You know, we're seeing these markets: euro against the dollar, pound against dollar, Aussie dollar, all falling because the dollar's had a good run the last few days. But again, with the Australian dollar against the US dollar, uh, we've been in this trend since October. Big support. Historically, around 66.50, 66.70. Do we see a bit of a snapback for the Aussie dollar next week versus the, uh, the what's it, the US dollar? Let's see what happens. And oil, oil has, see, again, this, this um, sideways range remains intact for oil. So it's interesting, but also boring at the same time. And if we pick up on the, uh, the trend off the highs, I'm basically saying the same thing I've said for the last few weeks on oil. Uh, we had been in a downtrend from June last year, arguably from uh, March, when we saw it peak, again on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. 
Market sells off, breaks the trend, but cannot break the previous high so far. Those previous highs were 83.75, something like that, and we're just banging around in the range. So whenever we see the price of oil get knocked back to the low 70s, the buyers come back out, and whenever we see it rally uh, up above 80, the sellers come back out. And that's it, that is the story for oil. So, you know, from a short-term point of view, another interesting one next week. I've got to find a way of turning off my, uh, my live cattle alert, there we go. Um, so, uh, let's see, let's see what happens next week. You know, I'd be leaning towards perhaps a bounce on oil next week. And natural gas, I came out of my natural gas trade this week. I, I did lose money on the trade, I moved the stop up a bit, uh, but I did get stopped out of it after joining the merry band of bottom pickers on natural gas. And I'm glad I did, because it's turned, it's turned a bit lower today. So after looking for a little bit, for the tiniest flicker of hope, actually, we're just going sideways, isn't it? Um, even as we're, we're doing this now, natural gas, if we flip this over to an hourly, we can see it a bit, there we go. So in the current hour, so since, um, well, it is almost an hour ago, we're nearly at the end of this hour candle. So it's traded as low as 2.30. If we flip it over to the weeklies, there we go. I think 2.25 is that old level, the lows from December 2020. So that's a uh, two year plus low. The downtrend on natural gas continues. Just when, you know, it was given a bit of a hope. We did have, we did have quite the odd run now and again, the odd good run natural gas over the last week and a half or so where it did get a move on, but it gave it all up on Tuesday and it's just been slipping lower uh, since then. So um, I think the risk is it's gonna put more pressure on natural gas because yet again, those going short uh, get rewarded and those buying, getting their fingers burnt. It's gonna, you know, from a market psychology sentiment point of view, it's gonna make them more nervous. So I think the risk is perhaps for deeper falls in natural gas, particularly if we click through these December 2020 lows around uh, 220, let's call it 225. And after that, what's next? You know, the next big low on the weekly chart, we've got to go back to the summer of 2020, 152. What do you reckon? Who would, who, it's, I wonder if anyone would bet against that. Natural gas losing another 80 cents from where we are now. It would be like a, almost a 40% fall, 35% fall from where we are now. Let's see. Let's see what happens. But um, I do think if it, trips through 225, we could see a bit more panic selling or distress selling, whatever you want to call it, going into next week. So uh, yeah, let's see. Let's see what happens with the price of, um, of natural gas. And um, yeah, that's it. Other, I mean, other interesting stuff. I had that live, I've got this live cattle trade going on. There you go. Oh, look at that. At least something's going the right way for me. Uh, so this is live cattle. Um, which presumably is the price of cows, I'm guessing. Um, great trends in live cattle. I think it's, uh, I think Nick, who's on the chat now, uh, was um, flagged it up on a, on a live stream a few weeks ago and I've had it in my watch list. So live, live cattle breaking out. What's, what's been the move in live cattle since July? It was 132, whatever that is. We're 162 now, so it's 30% higher. The price of the cow is 30% uh, higher, 25% higher. Than it was so that's that's one trade I'm in. Another interesting market I'm watching is this lumber market. I think we've had a look at this occasionally before. Um, you know, lumber prices of lumber went crazy. So it's wood, I'm assuming, because um, uh, I think I said there was a builder near me who was complaining about the cost of raw materials uh, end of 2021, beginning of 2022, and wood was part of that mix of this run up. So lumber peaked at 1400 in March a year ago, pretty much. And here we are now down at 391. But I do wonder with lumber, um, we had this move that started in Jan from 365 to 540. So what's that? A 180 move. I mean, it's, it's, again, it's a 50% rally almost in the price of lumber from Jan into bang on the beginning of Feb. Perhaps there was some enforced short covering on that. That move has completely, almost completely unwound. So it's, I think it's an, it's, a, it's an odd one, but it's an interesting market, I think, to keep an eye on the old lumber and see what happens next week uh, or in the next, the next couple of weeks, 
do we do we see a bit of strength coming in and uh, we should all be going out and buying wood let's see let's see what happens so uh so a quick summary for me what's the what's the stuff to watch next week dollar index is the one for me because we got the fed decision on not the fed decision the fed minutes on wednesday night my time uh so i think that's interesting inflation still very much uh the theme at the moment and stock markets um you know if you fancy some short-term market watching on a Friday afternoon. I think this NASDAQ is going to be interesting this afternoon. Uh, you know, we, I mean, yesterday, what was the peak yesterday? So the in-hours peak yesterday was 12.660 and we're at 12.310. So the market's lost 330 points since yesterday's peak. Um, do we see it try and stage something of a comeback? Interesting market to watch. I think this afternoon and into next week off the back of, um, again, those those Fed minutes uh, next week. And then going back to FX, it is the likes of the euro. That's the one I'll be watching next week to see what happens. Because I do, from a medium term point of view, you know, where I look to hold trades for days, uh, from weeks and months, you know, the dollar index was a great market on the way up for that. I am wondering... And again, it's, this is up to me. It's um, don't blindly follow what anybody else says on YouTube. Well, what I say on YouTube. But um, I think it's interesting to see if we do see some strength for this euro come in and maybe there's a bigger swing trade in there. So lots to watch next week. I'm away next week, actually, while I remember. So there'll be nothing midweek. But back, I'll be back on Friday doing the live stream as usual. So we'll jump into the stuff you want to have a looking at. But quick reminder, sign up for the newsletter if you want to. Free of charge. Comes out every Saturday. Next one goes out tomorrow. So as long as you're signed up uh, before about 8 a.m. my time tomorrow, you'll uh, be on the newsletter list. Um, go to my website, jonesthemarkets.com. You can see the trading course and all of that and the results and a bit more about the philosophy and um, why I chose to trade the way I did uh, over those three months. Uh, and any questions, drop me an email, dj at davidjonestrading.com. Right, let's... Have a look at some of the stuff uh, that you want looking at. So let's go back. Uh, right, the very first question, how much time do you spend out, oh, hang on, how much time do you spend daily on the one hour time frame? Not very much. I think someone asked me this question. Oh no, actually it was on the, I was on the course, in the webinar on the course. Someone asked me that in the end of January or in December. Not very long. I look at maybe, when I was trading this whole three month period, uh, and putting the results up on YouTube and on the website. Because um, I wanted to trade, and I just switched that off. Um, because I wanted to do lots of trades to show the methodology uh, that I go through on the course, I was looking at markets twice a day, which is more often than I normally look at them. But typically, half an hour, twice a day. So probably, an hour tops is what I spend looking at the hourly time frame because I know what I'm looking for. I know the sort of setups I'm looking for. There's there's four setups that I talk about uh, in the course uh, on the short term on the hourly charts. So I have a look in the morning, usually about between nine and ten, and then have a look normally this time of day as U.S. markets are opening, uh, sort of two thirty to three thirty onwards, something like that, just to see if there's anything. Uh, setting up, which is why for me this NASDAQ is interesting. I mean, it's, it doesn't quite fit in with my methodology, but I think it's quite an interesting trade from an aggressive trade point of view. Has the market overreacted to uh, what happens? So I don't, you know, I, I absolutely, I do waste far too much time sat in front of a computer screen just watching things go up and down, but I absolutely don't have to sit there 12 hours a day for my style of trading. You know, I think I think for, for a lot of us, definitely for me, it's um, counterproductive to sit there that long. Uh, so yeah, an hour a day on that. And perhaps half an hour every couple of days on the longer term stuff. If you see in my watch list here, it's basically the same watch list, but I've got a trading ST, trading short term, and I've got a trading long term, the markets I look at for the longer term stuff. And then I've got my ISA and SIP stuff. So I just sit there and go through, go through the list and see if anything's setting up. You know, but stuff like, I mean, for me, you know, stuff like that, the Euro, that's, you know, that, that for me, as a trend follower, it's, it's a really interesting market, what it's done this month. 
because perhaps this is just another pullback in the trends. You know, so it's quite easy to, for me, after doing it for so long, to spot the stuff I'm looking for. So it doesn't take too long. Uh, Bullard, Bullard from the FOMC was talking yesterday about a 50 basis point rise in March. I did read today that, um, and I think clearly this is one of the things that spooked markets, that the chances of a half a percent interest rate rise in March had gone up. Um, I think I, I read that, was it at the beginning of the week or the beginning of the month, markets were pricing in only a 9% chance of a 50 basis point rise in March. And after yesterday, they were pricing in an 18% chance of a 50 basis point rise. So I don't know. It does seem a bit, bit of an overreaction, I think. But who knows? I'm not on the Fed. Let's see. Let's see what happens in, um, in March. I would be surprised, you know, if they did 50. But let's see. We'll have to wait till the third week of March to see what happens. Please check carbon emissions. OK, let's have a look at carbon. How oh, do we get them on here? Carbon emissions. What do you reckon? Should we have a look at one of these um, ETFs? Should we have a look at that? Emer oh, that's emerging markets, isn't it? Carbon emissions. Why can't I get carbon emissions? Advanced emission solutions. I remember that because it's always an interesting market, that. Um, I can't seem to find it. If there's, if there's something else I should look for, let me know. Because I remember that was a great trend, the old carbon emissions. Let's come back to that. Um, coffee Arabica, Arabica, rocketing. Let's have a look at that. Oh yeah. Oh, that's that is an interesting move in coffee. Um, that does because I did wonder. I remember looking at this and I was wondering. I think we did it on a live stream, and I was wondering, right, is this a um, what's it? A reversal of the trend. There we go. That's that's what I was looking for. So if we go there, right, go to there. So that's um, when was that? Beginning of Feb. So is this, this is this the trend breaking out, or is this a false move through the trend and the market just dumps? And coffee's been a little bit sideways. It's been hugging that recovery line. So a little drift below it, but ba bang, it's breaking out now. That is another interesting market to watch next week. So many markets. To watch next week, so it's pushing through. One eighty three eighty was the Feb high. Ah, uh, that's that's another one I think for me for a potential uh, potential one for next week. Let's take a look on the hourlies. What's the move? It'd be interesting to see where it, where it finishes today. Uh, coffee. I said a right old move, isn't it? A right old move. Uh, so off the lows in Jan around one forty two. We're now one eighty five. So um, again, a big move, thirty percent move. Uh, another interesting market, I think, for next week to see if, uh, well, to me, it does look like that downtrend that's been in place since August of last year. Difficult for me to say that's still in place now. It's been a good good market over the years. It's another one I've traded a bit over the years. Well, we've had some good trends. It got a bit frustrating for me last year. Didn't tra I did one trade and got stopped out of it last year. Didn't trade it again after that. But some nice trends on the way up. And um, yeah. Good spot. Interesting one to keep an eye on uh, next week. Is natural? Uh, would you short natural gas or stay clear for now? Well, if you had to trade it, you'd have to go short. I'd have to go short, wouldn't I? Really? So if it went, if it went short now, so on the basis that I think there's a good chance that the natural gas fan club will all be having to change their trousers um, now. Um, I'd want to be short. And where would you where would you put the stop loss? An aggressive place for the stop. Too aggressive for me though. Would be above the highs for the today. If you thought the market was going to fall off a cliff, it didn't just go bang from here. A a more loose stop. Probably if you thought it was going to be a bigger sell off, perhaps up at two seventy ish, something like that. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I would. If you if you're going to, I mean, it's interesting that you know. It, one of, the, one of the reasons, probably the main reason I went long was I did wonder if everyone was getting too bearish and we had seen some stability in the natural gas price. It gone a bit sideways. Uh, that's completely ended now, of course, today with the move today. Uh, so, yeah, so I would be looking to go short. But as usual, uh, it's all about where your stock goes. So I would, I would, given we know 
what the volatility of this market is, I'd give it give it a bit of room personally. But um, yeah, the widow maker strikes again. Is natural gas in a spring action Wyckoff? Do you know what, Vince Siciliano? I have never heard that phrase at all in my life. So you've actually made me. I'm going to Google it now. I'm going to find out what a spring action Wyckoff is. Bear with me. It's every day is a school day. Spring action Wyckoff. Springing into action Wyckoff. The spring is a terminal act that... Uh, oh, God, hang on. Is it, where's it gone? Is it saying it's by terminal act that concludes the list, listless sideways price action and is followed by a robust rally to the resistance area? Okay. Um, yeah, that doesn't really help me. We recently explored... Uh, 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 uh. So it's like the last... Is it saying it's like the last gasp of a trend? Maybe it is. Anyway, I, wouldn't, I don't really worry too much about that sort of stuff, as you can tell. Um, so I don't know. It could, be, it could be a last fake out, couldn't it? And then natural gas is going to rally? I don't think it is. Um, and I don't... You know, one of the problems I have with technical analysis, and I am a qualified technical analyst is wanting to assign a level of importance to everything that happens in the market. You see that with candlestick charts, you know, candlestick patterns. Um, can, big candlestick fans will assign some importance towards every little combination. So I never overthink this stuff, as you may have learned over the years if you've seen these. Uh, but for me, you know, the fact that it had been holding and it's breaking down, uh, that doesn't look bullish to me. So uh, let's see. I'm, I'm going to do some research on, though, on that spring action Wyckoff. It might, it might change my change my life. Um, any views on dollar T E C L? No idea what that is. Let's have a look at it. T E C L. Direct. Oh, is it that? Direction Technology. Oh, what is it? Uh, daily. T is it an ETF? That's okay. So, so it's a tech. Is it a tech um, ETF? That's the three times leveraged ETF. Is that what it is? So is it like a, just a three times leveraged version of the NASDAQ, maybe? I don't know. I don't even know what it is. But if I was looking at it as a normal market, I'd be a buyer of a dip, probably, on that one. You know, I'd take the view. We'd seen a low in October of last year. Uh, we've seen a higher low there. We've seen a higher high there. I'd buy the dip. It's just whether you think the thing is going to take off from here or do you wait for a deeper sell-off. Me, as usual, I'd wait for a deeper sell-off. But the risk is I miss the sell-off that never comes. So, um, but yeah, I'd be a buyer of a dip on that. Whatever that is. I wouldn't actually, of course, because I don't know what it is. But um, that Australia, the Aussie 200. Let's have a look at that. So the ASX uh, 200. Australia 200 cash. Is that the market? There you go. I think, yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? It's going, it's going completely different direction, maybe because they're on the other side of the world, they're upside down, to a lot of stock markets in Feb. Um, I'd be a buyer of a dip again on the Aussie 200. I mean, I remember when we looked at this, I remember now, it's coming back to me. I wondered if you really wanted to go short whenever we were looking at this, we did have the highs from the last year and a half at 7,600 and a bit, and it's failed there again hasn't it? So, again, our TARDIS trading approach, if you go back in time to the beginning of the month, it was a nice risk reward on the short, still under pressure to today. I would, particularly if we see perhaps a broader US stock market uh, move upwards, I'd probably be tempted to be a buyer of a dip, but not today. Not today. I'd rather buy the NASDAQ than the Aussie index. Um, but uh, you could absolutely argue the trend is up, obviously, from October. But you could also argue that for the last year and a half, it cannot get much above 7,600. And that's exactly where it's failed uh, this time around, the Aussie. So an interesting one to watch. Interesting to see what happens if we sell off a bit lower from here and get to the lower 7,000s. Uh, but, but not much doing for me in that one at the moment. Um, Harry Hindsight's in the chat. <laughs> What's your view on TK tankers? TK tankers. TK tankers. What do they do? They do sort of shipping thing, I'm guessing. Transport. Yes. The clue is in the name, isn't it? TK tankers. 
transportation and marine shipping. It's a good trend, isn't it? Good trend. Nice breakout. Uh, yeah. It's truly weighed anchor, hasn't it, over the last um, six months or so. So, uh, yeah. Nice trend, blah, blah, blah. Breaks out uh, this month. Uh, another one I'd, I'd say, I'd be the buyer of a dip. The risk is the dip doesn't come. $36.60 was the breakout level. Uh, so again, uh, do you take the view, I'm gonna jump on board because it's just gonna go soaring away or do you wait for a dip? Like I say, I'm a wait for a dip person. Um, but the RSI is very overbought if you believe RSIs. So it is a little bit extreme. Perhaps we will get the dip. But a really good run. Are um, shipping costs going? I wonder why they're doing so well. I'm going to have a quick Google. I'm sure I remember seeing the other day that I think during COVID, obviously, uh, shipping costs went crazy, didn't they? Transportation costs went crazy. Uh, reporting Q4 results. Have they done that already? Have they? Okay. So um, was it strong on the earnings? Whatever. But yeah, it looks good. Chart looks good to me. Uh, so for me, I'd be a buy. Oh, here we go. We can see it down here, can't we? There's that. What's that? Swings to adjusted profit in Q3. And that's from November. What's this one here? Oh, I can't do it. Okay. Chart looks good. I'd be a buy of a dip. I never thought a global pandemic could happen. Never thought war in the EU could happen in my lifetime. Any thoughts on US defaulting on its debt? No. Um, I don't do fundamentals, me. So I don't have any opinion on the US defaulting on its debt. But you're right, actually. It's a, you know, some good points you make there. We've got to keep an open mind. You know, as you say, who'd have thought we'd all been locked away in our homes uh, for so long? And you know, we had, like you say, the, the Russian invasion of, um, of Ukraine. So um, yeah, keep an open mind about this stuff. But I don't, I don't have any, independ any opinion myself on that. Thoughts on the Ultra, <laughs> Ultra Pro SQQQ. So the QQQ is a NASDAQ tracker. So the SQQQ is a short NASDAQ. Well, again, for me, I mean, maybe you're American, which would explain it, but you're not allowed to trade things like CFDs. So the short QQQ, uh, the, this one, the, S, the SQQQ, goes up if the NASDAQ goes down, doesn't it? So if you thought the NASDAQ, is that NASDAQ stock though? That's the NASDAQ stock, isn't it? No, it can't be, it must be the NASDAQ index. So is it NASDAQ? Pro shares, ultra, no, it is the Q. Yeah, it's the Qs, isn't it? It's the Nasdaq index. I mean, it's weird. You'd be a buyer. I'd be a buyer of the short QQQs, but I'd be a buyer of the Nasdaq on a dip. It's really confused me that has. But if if I looked at that as a normal stock, I'd be a buyer of the short QQQs. Why doesn't that tie up with what the Nasdaq's doing? So look at the QQQs. That looks different, doesn't it? It doesn't look like a mirror image of the QQQs, which is a Nasdaq tracking ETF. So I am a little bit intrigued and confused by that. So um, yeah, but I'd be a buyer looking at that, but I wouldn't be going short the NASDAQ. Oh, excuse, my head's gonna explode uh, in a minute. Palladium, Palladium broke down this week, broke down through a big level, I was watching that. Um, so it's interesting. Again, another great market for me in the past. I haven't touched it hardly at all in the last couple of years. Palladium, which amongst other things is used for, oh, I can't even remember, catalytic converters. Um, so great runaway market from August 2018 up to just before the pandemic, Feb 2020. Massive sideways range since then. 1,540 low in December 2021. Doubled into March 2022. Came back down again. And here we are, yesterday or earlier this week, traded to its worst levels since August 2019, so a three and a half year low on Palladium. For me, I would, I'd have to go short, you know, I wouldn't be a buyer, because the trend is, it's been a good downtrend that, you know, even taking it off that extreme high in March of 2022, it's only a year ago, price is halved in a year. Um, broke, I was watching that level this week, broke that level, still looks pretty weak to me. So for me, any rally looks like a short selling opportunity. If I was going short now at 14.91, the closest I'd have my stop is 17.20, which is a wide old stop, but it's a volatile market, isn't it? You know, it's traveled through $400 in just the last five weeks or so. So it's an interesting one. I was watching that this week, wondering what was gonna happen down at these lows, thinking that the risk is, because the trend has been so strong, it was gonna break. And here we are, 
it absolutely has broken uh, the trend. So let's see. Does it start to make a base down here and threaten that downtrend? If it is going to do that, it hasn't started doing it this week is all I would say. So I think that is, that's another market that is on my longer term watch list as well because it's been a good market in the past. Uh, but breaking, breaking some big levels this week, the old play agent. Do you think Alibaba broke out from the downtrend? Yes. I think, I think that broke out a while ago looking at it. There we go. So, um, so for me, the moves we've seen since um, December of last year does suggest to me the downtrend has broken after being such a brilliant downtrend all the way down since um, October 2020 highs. It's the, is it the Chinese Amazon, isn't it? I think Alibaba. So from 310 down to $60 nearly. Uh, and I do think it is trying to stage a bit of recovery. So another one I would be looking for, the, for me, looking to be a buyer of the dip. We have lots, a lot of support from 85 to 97. It's currently trading just above $100. Uh, yeah, I'd want to see a bit of strength, uh, but be a buyer. But I'd be looking at having my stops somewhere, you know, an aggressive trade somewhere the other side of 96 would be my stop on that one. A more relaxed trade, give it a bit more room to wiggle around somewhere the other side of 85. But but I do, for me anyway, I do think it is on a bit of a potentially a recovery run from here. So uh, let's see. But it's an interesting stock to watch that one. Buy the dip on orange juice above 22,000. Let's have a look. Orange juice. Orange juice. Orange juice cash. So look at that. Wow. Look at that. We looked at that in the week, didn't we? Um, let's have a look at the, uh, the trend. I mean, a great trend again. I've missed this one. Great trend on that. From, where's it from? November 2021 lows when it was 114. Currently trading at 240, so it's more than doubled in um, what's that? A year and four months or so. Yeah, by the day, I mean even be a buyer now, isn't it? I think because it that's that's classic where waiting for the dip would have paid off. So being a little bit patient. So if we were taking that as the high in December last year, walk it forward, breaks out. So if I was looking at that, I'd say, yeah, I want to see a dip though. I want to see a dip. And I'd be worried I missed it. There's the dip. Dip. I would be, I would have bought it there. <laughs> Honestly, not just because I know it's higher now. So about 237, 238. Dips back. It's almost textbook that. Textbook. Doesn't happen very often, unfortunately. The, the markets don't do probably even half the time what the textbooks say they should do from a charting point of view. But um, comes back to the breakout point, retests the breakout point, has the bounce, be a buyer. If I was a buyer there, I'd probably whack my stop around, where would I put it? 204, 27, 14, 18, 215, 215, 216, buyer at 237, and away we go. Nice chart, that. I might even buy that next week, which, which at the moment, Given all my performance the last couple of weeks would be the kiss of death. But um, no, interesting market that. Let's, let's add that. That's going to go go onto the old uh, the Hall of Fame for next week, that one. Orange juice. Nice breakout. Where are we historically? We don't have the data, do we? Okay. I wonder what caused that breakout. 210 to 270. 60 move. It's a 30% move. What's going on? Let's have a quick look. Is it a crop failed or has there been some frost somewhere? Uh... Why is orange juice rising? Uh, florist, Florida orange growers are harvesting a shrinking amount of the crop now at its lowest in almost 90 years, according to reports. There we go. But so the risk is, are we buying into a bit of a, a spring movement, if that's the right thing? or a bit of an last exuberant move of the trend. But either way, I mean, it's been a pretty big move, isn't it? Let's see. Let's see what happens. Um, but, uh, poor Aussies. Any particular reasons on why you prefer CFDs, spread bets over options? Okay, let's talk about CFDs and spread bets first of all. So CFDs and spread, and spread bets are... Um, 
not available in the USA. So if you're in the USA, you can't do it. They were they were outlawed, stupidly I think, by the regulator. Probably about ten years ago now. Um, but it's a leveraged trading instrument. So CFDs and spread bets are just a way of leveraging your position in the market. So you could buy a ten grand position in the Nasdaq, for example, and only have to put up a thousand quid to control that position. So a small amount of money controls a much bigger position, obviously. Uh, so very similar to a future. So if you're an American watching this, if you're familiar with futures markets, what we have in the rest of the, the world are CFDs. Uh, and in the UK, we have these things called spread bets. If you are a profitable UK trader, you should, I think, as a general rule of thumb, always trade using spread bets because any profits are tax-free. Given that most people are not profitable, 70% plus of people are not profitable, the tax-free element of spread bets is neither here nor there because they're not actually making any profit overall. Um, but yeah, if you're profitable, spread betting in the UK is the best way of doing it. On the questions of options, it's a whole different topic that is. I do trade options. I, you can spread bet on options just to make it a bit complicated, more complicated. But um, let's, let me get an options price up for you and do a quick explainer why options. I don't think options, options can be frustrating for um, for what? For directional trading. Because the problem is with the CFD, right, here we go. Oh God, how much sense is this going to make? Um, with a CFD, if I want to buy the S&P, the S&P now, I'm just pointing on my screen, is trading at 40.65. I'm going to buy it at 40.65. If in a week's time that market is still at 40.65, um, I've not really lost or made anything, obviously. I've lost a bit in financing, but it's relatively cheap to finance it for uh, a week. If I bought an S&P 40, I'm going to scroll down to the options. Which side of the calls? Okay, they're on that side. Where's the bid and the offer? Bid and the ask, okay. If I'm going to buy, there we go, 40.65 S&P option, it's going to cost me 88. Keep that in mind, right? The 40.65 option cost me 88. When does that expire? February the 15th. Well, that's no good to me, is it? That's two days ago. All right, let's pretend it's still 88. The, 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 the point here is that um, I'm paying a premium to hold that option. So part of the options price, I think we mentioned this last time around, um, is me paying a premium to have the privilege of having that option. If in a week's time, let's pretend that option doesn't run out for two weeks. If in a week's time, that option, the market, the S&P, hasn't moved. I haven't lost anything on my CFD or my spread bet. My option will be worth perhaps quite a bit less because the market hasn't gone anywhere. So part, because the option is now a week closer to expiry, it's chipped away at the value of the option. You don't have that with a CFD or spread bet. So I am not a fan of, options are leveraged, but the thing that is the killer is the time decay. So if you want, I think we did, I did mention it last time around, if you want to find out more about it, Google time decay options. And I think if you read something like the Reddit Wall Street Bets Forum, they absolutely love certain people on there, a, an S&P option or the SPY, which is the ETF that tracks the S&P, a SPY option with like two days left to expiry. And it, it's just a killer because if the market doesn't move enough, um, you can still be right in direction, but you'll lose money because the, the time decay will eat into it. So I do like options for trading. I don't talk about it on these things. A bit more of a complex thing, but I don't use them for directional trading. I use them if I think the market's gonna go sideways. And that is selling options, which is a whole other game altogether and can absolutely blow up in your face if you don't know what you're doing. I think selling options has been compared to picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. So that gives you an idea of the risk, but I'm not a fan of options for directional trading. Okay, the China A50. I'll, we, I had a look at this market, I think, the other, the other week for something. I think it's an interesting market, the China A50. Here we go. China A50. Ah, oh, see, I... What was I... I can't even remember. I think I would, be, I would still be a buyer. For a short-term point of view, I'd be a buyer. I'd think, I just think it's questionable as to whether we've seen the trend shift in the China A50. I'd probably still be leaning to be a buyer. Clearly, it's been hammered um, a little bit today. The more conservative may want to wait for the highs from July to be taken out at 15, 15 150. But I'll be a buyer of a dip. This is, this is another going on, another one for my list next week of is it a buy the dip market. So for me, it's another one to watch next week. 
pretty well hammered today, falling out of the trend. I'd be watching 12,670. So if I was a buyer now, I'd want my stop below these lows from um, just before Christmas. Uh, let's see what happens. But another one where I'll be thinking, are we going to see some strength coming? What's the NASDAQ doing? The NASDAQ's holding, isn't it? Oh, it's, having a, uh, it's, only, it's only an hour. Let's see what happens. But I think the China A50 is an interesting market to watch to see if, there we go, this is on the hourly. See if these old lows hold uh, on the hourly. Tesla seems good long term. Let's have a look at Tesla. Did they say this week, I think they're t he's talking, old uh, Mr. Musk, about launching the, um, the Model 2, isn't he? So the small, I think it's like a Volkswagen Golfy side version of a Tesla. That'd be interesting, see what happens there. Mini, Mini launched the convertible electric Mini this week. I think they're only making 100, there's 150 available in the UK. And I think they're 50 grand a pop. And they've got a range of about 100 and something miles. So um, interesting one that. Um, but yeah, so Tesla, I'd be a, I would absolutely, I'd be a buyer of the dip in Tesla. Now, I was, I was, I would have been, I think I said last time around, I'd have been wrong footed on this um, in sort of Jan, Feb. I was expecting it to run out of steam. We had this massive run. In the stock, you know, the low in Jan was uh, 101, 102, $102. Ran as high as 200, and I would have absolutely been going short Tesla at 200 with a stop above 200, and bang, we are th we are through it. So yeah, be a buyer, be a buyer of the dip on Tesla. Um, as usual, the only question is where does your stop go? The closest I'd want my stop, I'd flip it over to. Um, an hourly chart. I should say as well, I, I am going to sort out, in the old days, I used to have a trading account to trade with. I am going to sort out a trading account for these live streams to do some actual little trades while we're doing the live streams. But if I was a buyer of Tesla now at 203, I put my stop at the other side of 180. So the lows on the way up, second of Feb lows down at 180. Uh, yeah, be a buyer of a dip uh, on Tesla. Um, ITV came to life last week on JP Morgan's target of 140 because of their ITV X platform. Okay, that is ITV, the UK TV stock, if you're not familiar with them. God, they did. So that, I'm guessing that was the JP Morgan bump, wasn't it? So where were they trading? They were trading 86p, touched, that, touched 97, back to 88 again. Let's have a look. I, I often say I'm not a fan of the old penny stocks, but um, they're doing well, aren't they? I'm sure they had a really good run. I'm sure I have owned them in the past, you know. I, I thought so. Got to go all the way back. Somewhere in here, probably. 20, God, like 10 years ago now. So they had this really good run, ITV, from um, about 52p up to 280, £2.80. Been down ever since. So the, the only, I think the bet is here, or the view is, is the big trend over? Or is the big trend still down? And I haven't drawn it. I haven't drawn it very well. Uh, and that that would be my view. So you, so how lucky do you feel? I would be. I'd still be patient. It's one for me at the moment. Where I'd be a bit more patient. But you know, it's been a good run since September. So for me, the only it's a hard thing. But I do think in investing and trading, being patient is a really important skill. And it's not a skill a lot of us have as human beings, particularly those of us who are attracted to trading and markets, being patient is hard. But you know, you'd look at this and I'd say, well look, the, the trend for ITV has been down for seven years. So for seven years, we've seen this stock, broadly speaking, slide. Are you gonna risk everything? Because uh, it's been rising for the last five months. You're gonna call the turn because it's gone up for four, four months, even though it's been going down for uh, seven years. I don't know, but it's an interesting one to watch, you know, and in its defense, the latest big sell-off did not quite take out the 2020 lows in ITV. So it's another interesting one. Like I say, I'm not a fan of the old penny stocks, but um, that's it. Right, that's it. We're done, aren't we? I've talked far, God, far too long today, an extra five minutes today. So we'll wrap things up there. Loads to watch next week with these um, Fed minutes. On Wednesday night. So like I say, I will be watching the dollar index. I am short the dollar index at the moment. So I am hoping the dollar doesn't like whatever gets said on Wednesday night and goes plunging down, which also makes this euro trade 
and interesting trades into next week if we do see a bit of reversal on the euro. Uh, and then also, I do, you know, I do think that stock market, oh, I think stock markets have got a reasonable chance of bouncing back next week. There's the, there's the hourlies on the NASDAQ. Poor old the natural gas bull gang, once again. Uh, a merciless move in natural gas. Interesting to watch that. I won't be going anywhere near that for at least a couple of weeks. I think natural gas, we'll see what happens. So tons of stuff to watch. Coffee, of course, we had a look at that, didn't we? Breaking out. So much stuff going on at the moment. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. Like I said, there's no live stream on Tuesday next week. Be back next Friday, the, uh, the 24th. Go to the website, sign up for the newsletter. I'm going to finish writing that once I finish this now. Uh, that goes out tomorrow. Good trading tip in there tomorrow. Some good stats in there tomorrow for stats fans. Um, have a look at the trading course, jonesthemarkets.com. Great trading course. Best one out there. Read the Trustpilot reviews. Any questions about anything, drop them in an email. As I often say, I don't have all the answers, but I do have an opinion. I've been doing this for a long time, so I give you an opinion. Okay, that's it. We'll wrap things up there. Enjoy the weekend. Have a good week trading next week, and we'll do it all again um, next Friday.